everyone. Welcome to this episode of our speaker series in digital marketing. Today, I'm joined by Jennifer Dolsky, who is the president and COO of Change.org. Actually, I met Jennifer way back when, when I worked at Yahoo. Jennifer was a marketer there who I was super impressed by. Jennifer actually managed about two thirds of the marketing for the Yahoo business. So welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Anka. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So can you tell us a little bit more about Change.org? I'm sure many of you know Change.org, but we would love to hear from you what Change.org is all about. Absolutely. So Change.org is an empowerment platform. We help people all around the world start and win campaigns for change on the causes that matter to them. And it's a platform that consists of tools to help people start petitions, rapidly mobilize other people, and then engage with decision makers to actually make change happen. We have now 180 million people around the world using it, and we grow by about a million users every week. Oh, wow. That's yeah. super impressive. <laughs> so I'm sure that your marketing skills came to bear in this role quite a bit. So marketing and then change.org, like do the two Kind of align? Can you use marketing within this role? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we do benefit from is that the content on our site is very viral in its nature. So people who start yeah. campaigns have a built-in incentive to share them. A lot of our traffic does end up being organic. About half of our traffic comes from sharing. But that said, we do see marketing as giving us huge potential to grow the brand and more deeply engage our audience. We have two different types of marketers at Change. We have uh, some that, that actually market the core product and platform, and then we have others whose job it is to um, market, build awareness, mobilization around the campaigns themselves and drive impact. We call those people campaigners. I see, and would you say, so within the different marketing channels that exist, is there one in particular that stands out that's very effective for you? Actually, multiple channels are effective. So if you think about our campaigners, whose job it is to, again, build awareness and mobilization around campaigns, they primarily use social media marketing, email marketing, and actually traditional media outreach to the press because the stories are compelling. We're actually featured in the media 500 times a day with these stories. Wow. And increasingly, they're starting to use digital video as well. So yeah. the stories, again, are these amazing personal stories about people who want to create change. And the more we can put them into video and share them on social media, the more effectively we are able to mobilize people. Yeah. And would you say that that's largely organic social media, or is there also a paid aspect to social media? That part is primarily organic. The paid yeah. marketing we do is more from the other marketers whose job it is to to market our platform. So when yeah. people wake up in the morning and think they want to change something in the world, we want them to think of change.org as that place. So yeah. our core marketers primarily use SEM, uh, so search engine marketing, to make sure that if you go to start a petition, that change.org is where you start. Yeah. Uh, they use email marketing, which again is less paid, more just marketing yeah. among mm -hmm. our own audience, mainly to build engagement. And then we do use some retargeting as well uh, around a new business model that we recently started. I see, I see. And can you tell me a little bit more about retargeting, how that works yeah, for you? Sure. Or? So we have three different business models at change.org. Uh, one is an advertising product called Promoted Petitions, where people can chip in to promote the petitions they care most about. Uh, the second is a crowdfunding product where you can attach a fundraiser to any petition and mm -hmm. uh, raise money. And the third is a new product uh, about membership. So people can become members of change.org. They can support the work we do on the platform either for change.org in general or around specific causes they care about. That's the product where we're starting to use some retargeting. I so see. people come, they look at our membership page, they may click through the flow but not quite become a member, and we then reach out to them on other platforms about that product. I see, and you found that to be successful, the remarketing We're very campaigns. early in the yeah. process. Mm -hmm. We only launched yeah. this about uh, a couple months ago, and we're, we have some 
membership product live in uh, about 15 countries and it's off to a really great start, really passionate users who are excited to become members and learn about the impact they're creating in the world. Um, the retargeting is very early, so a little too soon, but I'm, yeah. I feel mm -hmm. good that it's likely to be effective. Yeah, it sounds like a great channel for yeah. this particular purpose. Definitely. Yeah, that's right. Very and cool. we don't yeah. need to do a lot of acquisition marketing for that product because as I said, we have a lot of organic growth. So where we, the limited amounts of paid marketing we do, we focus at the very top of the funnel, trying to get people to start petitions on change.org. Yeah. yeah. So when you think back in your career, so you've been part of marketing in Yahoo, which was more commercially focused, mm -hmm. and then marketing for social good or social causes. Do you see kind of comparisons, like things that are similar, different? Yeah, I mean, th there's certainly a lot that's similar, you know, at, at a high level. Marketing is about great storytelling, right? You yes. want to create something that's a compelling message that people will relate to. The messages may be different, but being able to be creative and a good writer and great visuals, that's all the same. Uh, the analytics are the same. You know, there's yeah. so much testing and learning and marketing to figure out which messages are working with which audiences and which channels. That's, you know, all yeah. the same. Um, so what you are marketing may be different. Um, and exactly how you market it may be different, but the tools you use are the same. Um, one other thing we, we've seen that's been pretty interesting is um, because we are so viral and because social is such a big part of it, and we're a global company, really thinking about how those sharing channels vary in different parts of the world and how they're evolving over time has been important to us. So as an example, Facebook is a big part of our, you know, drives a lot of traffic to us in yeah. the US, but in other countries, WhatsApp or Line or VK in Russia might be the bigger driver. And so we've really had to think, you know, creatively about how to optimize our sharing flows around what tools people are using in which markets. I see. And do you use, so do you have an analytics department that looks at specifically kind of how different parts of those channels are working in different countries? We do. I mean, we have a, a data science team and a data analytics group. They don't, they're not set up specifically around marketing analytics, but they look at analytics, yeah, analytics across, across the whole support. company. And that's yeah. one of the things that they look at. Um, the other thing that's been interesting is to see how trends are changing over time. So for instance, it used to be much more um, broadcast sharing on social media platforms and one of the things that we've seen recently is the rise of the messaging platforms so WhatsApp is a good example but also Facebook Messenger and how yeah. people are now sharing to you know large groups but not necessarily publicly to the entire world but these yeah. large groups of people bring just as mobilization as much mobilization to these campaigns. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, and I think, so you mentioned storytelling, and that's one of the things that we focus on in our class as well. Marketing starts with, yeah, it starts with good content, and from there you distribute. Yeah. Um, you've also done some storytelling yourself, like for instance, published on LinkedIn, yeah. um, and I've seen some of those stories and I've liked them. Um, would you have some tips for people around kind of how to use that storytelling and kind of do that promotion around your own brand yeah. um, and use that from a marketing perspective. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I started writing on LinkedIn as an influencer in 2013 when they first launched it. And I think I benefited from being one of the earlier people who was doing that. Um, and a lot of my posts got much bigger than even I expected. In fact, the, the most popular one I have written to date is a post that I wrote about my father called Don't Work With Jerks, which by the way, good tip. Um, <laughs> and I wrote it on Father's Day just about my dad, you know, here are five things I learned from my dad. And it got so popular that day, it was literally like Bill Gates and Richard Branson and me on the same page of the most popular post that day. And so now, even now to this day, when you look at my profile and it says people also viewed, like Bill Gates or something will be on my page. Um, so really the key to all of this is having good content. And yeah. I will say it's, got, it's gotten more crowded, so it's harder to get your good content out yeah. there. The thing that I've seen worked on the LinkedIn platform is making content A, relevant to that audience, which is a work-based audience, yeah. B, relatively short. Short content tends to do better than longer. Yeah. And in bite-sized pieces. Like my posts tend to say things like five lessons I learned from X or, 
you know, three yeah. ways not to do X, Y, Z. The list format tends to work pretty well on yeah. LinkedIn. Medium, on the other hand, is much more long form and I think is is an audience that's more open to yeah. longer mm-hmm. content, more in-depth content. So it really partially depends on the platform you're working with. The other thing is finding ways to promote your own content once you write it. So even starting with your own network, um, you know, cross posting on different platforms. Like sometimes I will write on LinkedIn and cross post it on Fortune or cross post it on Huffington Post and that can create more yeah. traffic around a single um, a single topic or article. And then I hate to say it, but I mean, the truth is that those tips, you know, the tricks of the trade really do work. And sometimes yeah. it bothers me that they work, but but the fact is they work, and if you want something to get traffic, you yeah. should think about using them. So catchy headlines, images that are compelling, celebrities, you know, all the, the lessons we learn in marketing, like they're true for a reason because human behavior is attracted to those things, yeah. and so people can yeah. leverage them as well. And would you say that some of that translates as well to starting movements? And Because if you think about kind of getting your content published, getting your content distributed, yeah. I'm assuming some of that applies to starting a movement as well. So do you see some of that at change? That's right. I mean, the thing that we see at change, so when we think about ways to create successful campaigns or a successful movement, there's really three things we tell people. One is start with a compelling story. And we've talked about this already, but the key learning we have from change.org is that the more personal your story is and the more vulnerable you're willing to be around it, the more other people will rally behind you. It's a very counterintuitive thing, but if you're trying to change something and it matters to you for a reason, telling people that reason, which may be scary, is actually the thing that will make you most successful. So the first is compelling and personal story if you can find one. If you don't have a personal story, then finding someone who does is the next best strategy. The second is to share things as widely as possible. And this we've talked about as well. So sharing with your own network, sharing on every network you can find, using everything from social media to messaging apps to video, et cetera. And the third is to understand who it is that you are trying to persuade and what motivates them. And that may be, in the case of change.org campaigns, it's usually a decision maker, an elected official or a head of a company, and understanding that you are asking the right person who actually has the power to make the change you want and that you're asking them something that is within their control to do are the key steps. So if you want to be successful, you have to understand that last piece. So... I thought I'd switch gears for a little bit. Um, We met when we were at Yahoo, you were in a marketing role. um, And I was just wondering, say, towards our students who are starting their marketing careers, or many of them are, are there certain things that you just wished you knew um, and that you would want to give as pieces of advice to marketers who get started? Yeah, I think there's really two things, looking back on it, that I wish I knew at the time that once I understood, I felt made me more effective. Uh, The first is, to really keep an eye on how things are changing. I said, now I have teenage children, so like my, I say ask the teenagers, like this would be my rule, ask the teenagers, because the, the way people use the internet and the way people use their mobile devices and so forth, it changes so quickly. And we saw this in the early days of Yahoo, I used to work on search and we would, we had access to the search logs and you could see out of nowhere came first MySpace and then Facebook. And I would say some of us were late to picking up on those channels as they were growing. And so I would really encourage people to stay abreast of trends and try to take advantage of new channels as they're coming up rather than waiting until everybody else is using them. That's the first piece of advice. Um, The second is about being scrappy and maybe not feeling like you have to ask for permission too much. So there were a few things that happened early in my career that ended up being really effective and were just things I managed to try on the side. You know, if you can find a way to get a little bit of budget or even test something with no budget, work out an agreement with someone, like sometimes you can prove that something works without having to go and make a huge case for it and ask for a big budget. I. I'm not sure this is true, but I think I may have been the first person to 
ever A-B test an ad on the internet. Because in 1998, my job was to run marketing for Yahoo Shopping, and I wanted to look at two different types of ads. One had an HTML drop-down bar, and the other one was an animated GIF. And I said, like, how do I know if these two things are performing better against each other? But instead of, you know, trying to make some big project around it, I just went and found one engineer who was willing to do something for me. And then all of a sudden I had the data and it was so much easier for me to say, here's what I learned, now look at what we can do with it. Yeah. And at that point, we didn't even have a tool like that for our advertisers. Yeah, so, yeah a platform. Or, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so be scrappy. Be yeah. scrappy and ask the teenagers. Yeah, that's good <laughs> advice, actually. So is that where you get most of your trend advice from right now? Oh, from the yeah. Teenagers? So, I mean, yes. I am an avid Snapchat user, which is very embarrassing when you're in the office and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and people see you doing that. But, you know, yeah, you got to do no, it. You have to try right. all of those things. I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Yes. So when you're hiring for people in marketing positions, what are the types of skills you're looking for? What do you think you want to find in a person in order for them to be a great marketer? Yeah, so we really look for three key things. One is great storytelling and strong writing. So this, as we've said, the core of everything is, is creating excellent content. And so people who are creative but also good writers is important to us. Uh, the second is strong analytical skills. So, so much of marketing is really understanding what channels and testing so many different things. We, we do something uh, at change.org called headline derbies, where we get all these people together to just brainstorm different headlines for emails and for social yeah. and so forth. And um, so both the creativity, but also the analytical ability to see what's working and not. And the other is high user empathy, right? We, I mean, to be a great marketer, you have to understand what users need, what yep. they care about, what messages will resonate with them, but also, in many cases, feeding that back into the product to make sure you're building the right things for, for people in the yep. first place. Yep. And then, more recently, we tend to look for specific skill sets. So, for instance, as I mentioned right now, we're building a membership product. So, we've been looking for people who have the skills and experience in recurring subscription businesses because yeah. it's different when you when you have a recurring business where you need to both acquire customers and engage and retain them over time yeah. mm -hmm. versus being sort of purely an acquisition marketer. Yeah. So when we think about kind of all these trends and things that have changed, so I actually even think back and I'm like, wow, when I started teaching, there was no Facebook advertising. So <laughs> maybe that dates me, but it's um, thinking about trends, kind of what's going to happen next, right? When you think about five years from now, what do you think digital marketing will look like? Yeah, this is a, it's a tough question. <laughs> and I will be honest that the only thing I am sure of is that I don't know and that it will move faster than any of us think it will. I, like you, I have so many stories. I remember actually the day someone came in to tell me about ebooks, talk about dating myself, but they were saying, you know, there's gonna be these digital books. And the people I was sitting with said, oh, but that's gonna take forever. And it was literally two years from that date until borders went bankrupt. So these things happen so much faster than we expect. And the types of things I would be keeping an eye on, though again, my predictions are unlikely to come true. Um, one is AI, right? There's just yes. so much that will be happening that we'll know about people and that um, we'll be able to do if, on that sense. The second is um, devices, like it is very possible that the phone, even in five years, won't be the primary device. Will, will there be, you know, virtual things on our, you know, we'll wear elsewhere, will there be glasses, will, who, who knows? Um, but the form factor of the device is likely to change. Uh, and the other thing is uh, sort of video versus text versus speech. One of the things yeah. that has been clear to me even as I start to talk more and more into my phone is that no matter how fast I type, I'm always faster at speaking. And I just, I think so much more, you can see it in Echo and the Google Home, like so much more of what we do will be driven by our voice and that marketers will need to think about what that means. Like there was this one example, right, of the, um, I think it was Burger King yes, that did the ad right. that targeted mm -hmm. Google Home, but just yeah. so much more of what's happening with voice. And I think that marketers will need to think about how to adjust yeah. to that. 
Yeah, that'll definitely be a change. And I actually see it's interesting you said that your kids like lead you to trends. Yeah. I see my kids actually searching by asking Google rather than time. typing anything yep, in. Exactly. I find strange, but that's what they do. So yes, yeah. definitely changes. Good. Well, I would like to ask you like a last question. Um, really just about in general, when we think about marketing, advertising, is there any particular campaign, advertising campaign that has stood out for you, that has moved you, that you've been thinking about? Um, just one that left a lasting impression. Yeah, what I love that's happening right now is the overlap between video and digital. And so you have these amazing stories that we used to only see on TV now coming out on social and in everybody's mobile device. And for me in particular, the ones that are catching my attention are these ads that are about how to make the world better, right? I mean, I work at change.org. All that we do is about creating a world where people are not powerless and they feel like they can make change every day. And my favorite example of this, actually, given the way that our world is becoming more and more polarized, there's a, a TV station in Denmark. I don't know if you've seen this ad, but they they made a television ad for their television station that talks about unboxing people yes I see. and yeah. right and mm -hmm. they should start with people in boxes and their separate groups and then they say things like anyone who's who's a step parent come over here and they all come in out of all their different groups they come into the same box together and they get sort of more and more personal over time until it's things like anyone who's lonely come and stand in this box together. And it just shows, it's a, it's an advertisement, but I think most people don't even realize it's an advertisement because it's giving yeah. such a moving positive message. And I think there's more and more examples of this happening now. There's this Heineken ad that's going around that's exactly, social right yes. now about mm -hmm. how to break down walls between people over a beer. Um, but, yeah. you know, yeah. brands have the power to share messages like this that will make us a better, more connected world, and I think that's really powerful. Yeah, no, I would agree, and it seems like a lot of that kind of starts with, again, with very good storytelling. That's right, and, and so the better the story, and also the more effective the ad, right? Because yes. what's happening is people are then organically sharing these advertisements. Yeah. That's amazing, yeah. like the amount of yeah. extra reach you get for having a really great story is priceless. Yes, no, I would agree. Good. Well, thank you so much, Jen. That was very interesting. I learned a lot. I'm sure our students did. You've had a very impressive kind of career and track going from being a marketer to becoming the president of change.org. We've seen you do amazing things there. The company has grown a lot. Um, so we're just very grateful that you made the time to be with us and to talk to us um, and to talk to our students. So thank you. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, Anka, for inviting me. It has been a treat for me to spend time talking with you about this. And I think your students are so lucky to have you as the person putting this course together because you have incredible experience. Trust me, she's amazing. I know you know that, but <laughs> thank you again. Good. Well, thanks so much.